Hey, everybody. The Next Lawyer Up podcast is sponsored by Bond and Botus. You can find us at bondandbotus.com. That's B O N D A N D B O T E S.com. We practice in the areas of consumer bankruptcy, consumer law, including collection and telephone harassment, credit report issues, tax issues, security clearance issues, social security disability, and VA disability. So, with that, let's start the show. So let's go ahead and talk about today's episode. Uh, Today I'm going to be speaking with attorney Jerry Beasley. Uh, Mr. Beasley is the founder of the Beasley Allen Law Firm, which is located in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, even though that's the the base of the firm or the the home, the headquarters, if you will, they practice all over the country. Um, it is not an overstatement to say that there's not a lawyer in the state of Alabama, and, and frankly, probably most of the country, that doesn't know the name of Jerry Beasley or Beasley Allen. Um, Mr. Beasley's success, his accomplishments, his legal skills, I mean, it, it's absolutely, or, or they are all absolutely legendary. Um, Mr. Beasley is also really a part and parcel of Alabama history. Uh, he served uh, our state as lieutenant governor uh, for a period of time, and even he served as as the go- actual governor uh, during the period of time during the assassination attempt uh, and then convalescence of then Governor George Wallace. So, there's not much I could probably spend an hour just talking about his accomplishments, but. I think we'll be better off talking to him directly. So I'm looking forward to talking to him, and uh, I hope you like this. Well, Mr. Beasley, I appreciate you joining me, or I guess better stated, you letting me join you. We're at your uh, your office here in Montgomery. Well, thank you, Ron. It's really good to see you. I'm glad to have an opportunity to talk with you. Well, I really appreciate it. With you know, I uh, I do an introduction before lawyers sit down with me, and with yours, it's almost kind of brief because I don't want to be gushing too much about the the impact you've you've made uh, on our state both just with the, the work you've done, you know, politically, of course, for the state and just your, your legal, I don't want to even say skills, but just the legal cases you brought, what you've done for our state. So, um, so I've, I've said a lot of nice things about you already, just so you know. Um, we're, we're here and I, uh, right now, we're in a, a, there's a bunch of buildings you have here in downtown Montgomery. So how many lawyers do you have working with you now? Ron, we have a, a- Right, 85 lawyers right now, and about 225 support staff. Roughly, that the number of lawyers varies occasionally. We have a few that come in and work on a contract basis, sure. just on specific cases. And we've just opened an office in Atlanta, so we probably have added a few uh, in the last few weeks. But right now, it would be somewhere in the in the 85 range. When you said staff of about 225. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here, and in my head, we have about 12 in our Huntsville office. Yeah. So I'm thinking, to, you know, 300 or so, that's a lot of people. It, it really is. In fact, uh, I never had any idea when we started the firm back in 1979. I, I really started it as a sole practitioner. And, it, never, and I wanted to ask you about this. So how many, yeah. when you started in 1979, how many, how many people were there? I had, I was the only lawyer, had one secretary and one sort of a paralegal, legal assistant, but basically three people in the entire office. Frank Wilson came in probably at the end of the first year, Greg Allen the, maybe in the second year, and then it's grown from there. Well, that's amazing. Do you look at that growth? Do you ever do kind of an introspective look at the growth? That's pretty amazing. Well, well it's very amazing. Truthfully, it, I, I never expected it to get this big. Right. Uh, my wife reminds me of that quite often. In fact, she, <laughs> she asked me years ago, back probably maybe 1980, 81, she said, how many lawyers do you eventually want to get in this firm? I said, maybe five. <laughs> and I was dead serious. <laughs> We're going to go really big at five, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe and, a support and, staff at You ten. know, I, I enjoyed it when it was, when it was just a handful. Uh, you really knew people better and Right. You'd see everybody every day. And right now, since we are in four buildings, 
uh, my fear is that I'll meet somebody and introduce myself <laughs> and they, they work for us. It was funny about that. Believe me, they know who you are. <laughs> In fact, I went back on the first floor, back toward the back. Uh, I walked through there one day and we had a new secretary and she stopped me. She said, uh, sir, said, uh, you really can't come back here. This is just for Beasley Island employees. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's funny. <laughs> Give me the name of that employee, right? I told her, I said, you're just doing your job. I said, you, you get an A+. Plus. No, that's funny. So I want to kind of go way back, kind of kind of at your, the start. So so where are you from originally? Well, my family came to Alabama in, in 1819. From, from where? Uh, from the Carolinas. Okay. In fact, there were four brothers. They got as far as Montgomery and split. Two of them went to Crenshaw County. And the two that I come from uh, came to Barber County, went to Barber County. And the, the more famous of the group would be Terry Beasley, the football player. Oh, yeah. He played at Auburn. He's from the Crenshaw County group. Okay. And the, so that would be your cousin, right? That is correct. Okay. And uh, I was actually born in Tyler, Texas, though my mother and daddy were living out there at the time. My daddy sold tobacco, of all things, for R.J. Reynolds, and they moved him to Tyler. And uh, I, I was born there and lived there for two years. And uh, they moved back to Barber County, and the rest of my life was spent there until I moved to Montgomery in 70, early 71. So, so growing up, did you have brothers and sisters? One brother, Billy, who's now in the state Senate, uh, the only white— Was he older or younger? Younger, five, about four and a half years younger. He's the only white Democrat in the Alabama state Senate. No kidding. One, one of eight Democrats. Yeah, it's a, well, I, we're going to get to that in a little bit. Things sure have changed. Changed dramatically, and then occasionally they change back. Yeah, well, I, I guess I don't know if we should leave politics out of it, but I, I hope the change comes sooner rather than later. Well, a lot of folks feel that way. In fact, uh, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, back when George Wallace was in power, the same people were Democrats then who are now right. Republicans. Republicans. You know, I was thinking about that, now that you say that, when I, I was reading up on your biography. I mean, you're exactly right. Uh, interesting. Well, so you, um, did you, were you, did you live in the same house growing up or did you move around? Uh, a bit? We lived in the same house in Clayton, uh, which was built by my grandfather. He, made, he built it out of green lumber and is, is, if anybody knows anything about lumber, uh, as it aged, it widens the cracks. So we had a lot of air conditioning before they <laughs> had air conditioning. <laughs> well, what um, uh, did you go to the same school? Went to, uh, went to Clayton High school, Elementary School and then high school, uh, same building. Graduated from Clayton High. How did you do scholastically? Uh, in high, high school, I didn't study a whole lot. I got by. Stayed. That's a bane, the bane of being a boy, yeah, <laughs> interested and, in other things. I, I really uh, didn't have to study very hard, uh, primarily because they didn't require it. The only teacher that I had that I thought was really hard and mean was an English teacher named Miss Sammy Davis. Turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me because she really made you work in that class and you learned a lot. And uh, I'm not sure the kids are getting that now right. in English. And then that was English that, that you studied. Did you play sports or what did you do? Yeah, your... I played uh, really all the sports. Played football, basketball, baseball. Ended up signing a football scholarship at the University of Georgia. Oh, no kidding. And did you go to Georgia? I went to Georgia and ended up at a junior college in Mississippi at the end of my, in January, really. And uh, a little junior college at that time called Perkinson State Junior College. Located about 10 miles south of Wiggins, about 40 miles north of Gulfport. And it was in the country and a beautiful school. Well, were you playing football? Played the, football, okay. played, played quarterback and uh, went through spring training there. I'd hurt my knee uh, earlier and it was kind of a rehab project. But back then, uh, it, it was a little bit different as far as a, a knee injury generally would put you out. Right, right. So, so what happened? So you're, you're there, you're going I, to school playing football? Yeah, I, I ended the year at, at Perk and uh, knew that I was going to have difficulty playing the next year because of my knee. So I dropped out of school for two years, went back to, went back to Clayton, went home. 
And what were you thinking at this point? So you're probably 19, 20. Uh, what are probably, you thinking about your career? How am I going to put food on the table? Yeah, I, I really wasn't thinking, just to be honest with you. <laughs> right. In fact, I, I I went back and my daddy farmed and I helped on the farm. And, and my mother had had a, a grocery store. She had died when I was 15, so somebody else was running it. I helped in the grocery store and helped on the farm. Planned to stay there for a year and then go back to school. As it turned out, uh, at the end of the year, we couldn't afford for me to go back, so I stayed an extra year, two years total, and then I went to Auburn. Is that to make money? You were just trying to put uh, money away? Not really. It just exists. Uh, I didn't have any interest in money at that time at all. Uh, didn't think too much about the future, quite frankly. You know, there's a, a lot of people listen to this and they look at it from the prism of how successful you are in your law firm. Do you do you have any remembrance of being that age? And were you worried how, you know, are things going to work out for me? Ryan, you know, the strange thing, I can remember stuff as far back as two years old. My wife tells me I can remember trivia, so I don't remember much important. But I, I can remember football plays, for example. Now, why? I don't know. I can remember play in Abbeville, Alabama, for example, and I remember calling a play, running the play, scoring a touchdown. Uh, I remember things like that that really don't amount to much, right. but it, for whatever reason, uh, I have a pretty good recollection of past events. So did you, do you remember that time period? So you're now back at home working? Yeah. Are you kind of thinking about the future or just kind of I, like I, I, I probably was giving very little thought to the future, just to be quite honest. Uh, just waiting for Friday night and <laughs> having a pretty good time right. working, getting up early, going generally uh, late, and weekends. I worked on Saturdays too. So and is this farming and grocery or both? Oh, both. Okay. And uh, I enjoyed the grocery store uh, for several reasons. One being having contact with people. You learn a great deal right. in a retail. It was a small store, but still. Uh, dealt with people from all walks of life and got to know kind of how folks what they thought and what they what motivated them and you'd hear things in there that they would tell you and you, you just learned a lot about human nature all right so now you're probably 20 <coughs> give or take mm, 21 probably, maybe I'm, no not quite that i was probably 18 okay so so what what happens next go back to Auburn. go to Auburn. Uh, you go to school uh, and, and, there. and you didn't go to Auburn initially. Is that Auburn, was that, that kind correct. of in your blood? or had No, you, in fact, uh, hey, it's I, close? I, I really hate to admit it, but I grew up in Alabama. Family. Okay, all right. And how I got to Georgia was sort of a mistake, really. I had a coach in high school who had played football at Ole Miss who had a friend on the Georgia uh, coaching staff, Jim Watley, Coach Watley. And uh, my coach made a deal that if I would go to Georgia, they would take Coach Taylor's younger, his brother, younger brother, who was on our team, who was a fullback and a year behind me. So I was sort of a package deal and didn't know it. Well, no, that, that you're being modest about your your skill as a quarterback. You must have been pretty good. For that time, I was pretty good. <laughs> Today, I probably would be, uh, if they had five strings, I'd probably be <laughs> right. fifth string. <laughs> So so you are so you go to Auburn, and, and what do you decide to study? Well, uh, when I got to Auburn, I was more serious about education. I never had been too awfully serious about it prior to that sure. time. I had my first year was uh, I didn't fail anything, but I didn't burn the books right. up they either. Saying, Mr. Beasley, you were at the top of your class. <laughs> well, in the junior college, I didn't even own a book. Uh, didn't have a book. Right. And made C's and B's. And so when I got to Auburn, I realized that I wasn't going to farm and, and I didn't have any interest in running a store. So my, my goal then was to get in school, get an education. And I really still had, had some thoughts about being a football coach, which was my early goal uh, even before I got to my first sure. college. And that, that makes sense. And uh, then I realized that that really was not going to work. So I, I just decided to sort of get down to business, be a student, and uh, I was in uh, school. I really had a, I guess, a business type uh, 
curriculum, but yeah, generally that. I, I majored in economics with a minor in history and speech. Okay. And I did the speech thing because I, I really had difficulty when I was in high school getting in front of classes and talking and speaking publicly. And I thought maybe that would help me. And as it turned out, it did. You, you know, by you saying that, and, and what's kind of amazing about that, I've never seen you in court, but I've heard stories and, and that people have, who have seen you in court. In fact, one of my partners was just telling me she saw you give a closing argument to a jury, and she said it was amazing. And by you saying that, there's a, um, uh, a documentary out right now. It's called Becoming Warren Buffett. And he says that, the only, have you seen this? The only diploma no. he has in his office, and he went to like... Uh, uh, Nebraska, and then he went to, I think, Columbia for a master's. The only diploma he has is Dale Carnegie's. Yeah, yeah. And he said, he goes, I was petrified of speaking in public. He goes, and that is the most valuable degree I have. I, I tend to agree with that. In fact, uh, the course that I can remember that I think hit me the most was a group discussion uh, deal where you would sit around a big round table, and Dr. Smith was the instructor. And he would call on us individually. We'd have to make presentations to the group, and uh, we'd have to answer questions in sort of a, just a general group discussion. And uh, I really think that broke the ice with me and sort of made me realize that I had to learn to communicate. And that is one thing that bothers me now about kids coming through the school system. When they get out, I'm afraid they really don't have the ability to communicate. Right. Uh, they can text. Right, right. And, I was about to say that's all they do is look yeah. at the text. And I, I really think that we need to take a real close look at the system to make sure that we emphasize both the written skill and, and the fact that you can talk to somebody. Well, well so, so you start this class where you going in pretty nervous. Hey, I've got to take this class, and this is an area that I'm not thrilled with. Well, the first, the first couple of sessions, I had difficulty even telling the instructor my name. And he, he, would, he really realized that I needed help. And so he, I think he took me on as a project. You know, I want to digress for a minute. Uh, two things you've just said, um, and that is about texting. And because I see this with my own kids. And, you know, one of the things I, I you know, in my law practice, to me, the, the, tel the art of the telephone is critical still. And, and people, they almost seem to crave it instead of communication by email or text or whatever, just because it's kind of a lost art. Would, would you agree? It is, it is becoming a lost art. And in fact, I've seen teenagers sit in a room where they could simply look across and talk to somebody and, and give them a text message, which is kind of hard for me to understand. Right, right. When you're right there. Yeah. And the other thing is just kind of listening to you talk and, and knowing about your your history with juries. The other thing, too, it seems with lawyers that you can't talk in, in kind of how you talked about the meeting people and learning about people from all walks of life in the grocery store. You can't talk above a jury. I mean, you have to talk. I always say direct it to like a sixth grader. I mean, that's how I learn. You know, treat me like I'm not a very bright sixth grade boy. Get it to that level. Well, you know, Ron, I, I think the big mistake that lawyers make, they think they're smarter than jurors. Right. And uh, I have found that you put 12 individuals in a jury box, let them sit through a trial, they're going to end up being a whole lot smarter than the lawyers in that courtroom. Right. Somebody on that jury is going to know more about a subject than the lawyer does. For example, we handle a lot of product liability cases. Yeah. And you'll have somebody on the jury who just because they have dealt with that type thing all their lives will know a lot more about the technical end of the case than the lawyer will. Sure. Uh, fortunately, in our firm, we have some folks that really grew up sort of being shade tree mechanics, and uh, it's helped them be good product liability lawyers. Right. Because they kind of know the... They, they, they can... Greg Allen, for example, can he could take them an engine, tear it down, put it back together. Uh, he, he would be a great engineer. And he's he, for that reason, he's probably the best product liability lawyer sure, that I've ever sure. dealt with on anybody, our firm, any, anywhere else. Well, and then he could, since he knows the complexities, he can boil it down to the simplicity or as, as he, simple as he, it can He get. makes it where you can understand right, it. Right, right. And when he takes a deposition of an expert uh, who would have an expert in some particular 
area of, of engineering, say, he will know as much about it as the engineer. Right, right to start with. And, and that really disarms these folks right. because they're not used to a lawyer knowing much. Right. Well, I've digressed a little bit, so I want to go back to Auburn. Sure. So, so you're at Auburn, you're taking your classes, so what happens next? Well, uh, that's where I met my wife. And Sarah had graduated from Emory University in nursing, five-year course, and about a little, she made it in record time. And I want to make it very clear that I'm older than she is. Wow. Uh, she uh, graduated from high school in Inslee High in Birmingham one year earlier than I did, but at an earlier age than, than I later. So I met her on a blind date and made my mind up pretty quickly that I was going to try to figure out some way to marry her. And this, so you're at Auburn now? I'm at Auburn. Jun sophomore, junior year? Um, I guess you'd call me a sophomore. Okay. I, I'm not sure my first year would qualify me as a real true sophomore. Okay, but, all right. Uh, when I started back at Auburn, I was, they said, I, I was in my second year, let's say. Gotcha. I, I made my mind up, though, that I was going to study, I was going to work hard, and uh, I took overloads every quarter. We were in a quarter system then. I'd take 23 hours, which is wow. uh, That's eight, a lot. Eight, 18 would be normal. Right. And graduated in 11 quarters as compared to the normal 12. Right. And uh, I really uh, were people a, in high school say, "Hey, what happened to Jerry? Well, <laughs> this they, guy's really they, turned they, it on." I think they would have been shocked to know that <laughs> I was passing it over. <laughs> so, so you graduate, and then, uh, and where are you at with your relationship? And what do you decide to do? Uh, but we, uh, when I was at Auburn, because I was out of sports, but I still had a little bit of, of interest in it. So, I actually worked in a bookstore uh, quite often. And also coached uh, Babe Ruth League Baseball. Okay. And uh, that would be 15-year-olds, 13, yeah. 14, and 15 at that time. And I guess it's that way now. And we, yeah. I did it for two years. And uh, we, in my second year, we won the state tournament, went to the World Series. And you were the head coach? I was the head coach and had a, an assistant named Mr. Razor Smith, who was probably then in his 60s. New baseball, like a, he was a, just a genius. And uh, how did you get the head co coaching job over uh, Razor? You know, that's a good question. I haven't <laughs> quite understood that. I, I, I think uh, probably because Sarah and I were renting our house where we lived from a man named Bob Chestnut, and he had a son who was on the team. And I think he talked them into letting me be the head okay. coach. Okay. And uh, the true head coach actually was Razor Smith. Right. So you're the de facto I, head coach. I, in title only, I was the head coach. <laughs> uh, so all right. So you're you're graduating Auburn. What what do you what I do you decide to do? Graduated from Auburn, and I by that time I knew I was going to law school. I applied at the University of Alabama. Was accepted. Went directly from graduation in Auburn. I believe in August of seven of uh, nineteen. 59, went directly to Alabama, enrolled, and went straight through there, some well, was in all. Well, so why do you decide, had you known any lawyers in your family or? or? Uh, not only no lawyers, there's nobody in my family who'd ever graduated from college. So, so what prompts you, because you, law school is obviously an extra three uh, years, you've got your degree. I had. Uh, Sounds like you may have another mouth to feed. Well, not quite, but but uh, we did have our first child, I believe, in in 1961. Uh, by that time, I was a uh, senior in law school. I, I, I've worked uh, as a well I, back to Auburn and, and the interest in law school. I developed that interest, and I'm not sure I can say exactly what prompted it, but started probably about a year before I decided to go to law school, which would have put it back in the, say, 19, maybe 60. Gotcha. No, no prior to that, it would have been, it would, had it been prior to the graduation day, so I'd say 58, probably. Okay. So, so you get to Alabama, do you have, you know how there's, so my wife's Auburn, so I'm, since I'm from Chicago, I'm Notre Dame, so I don't really have a dog in the fight, though my kids are at Alabama, so, but I know the, you know, my wife has kind of come around to Alabama, but begrudgingly, so how do you feel about going from Auburn to Alabama? Well, I can tell you that in the, in the entire law school, I was one of two Auburn graduates in the law school, right. so <laughs> we, we really caught a lot of grief there. Right. For, in fact, this would have been 
59. Coach Bryan had come there in 58. Is that correct? Uh, that sounds right. And uh, by that time, uh, he was established in Alabama as a, as a football team. Right. And they beat Auburn in 59, uh, 60. And, and after that, it was – but during the time I was in law school, we, we were – Singled out as the Auburn I guys. Gotcha. Now, did you did you swing over to the Alabama side eventually? Uh, or? No, it made me a better Auburn fan. <laughs> right. Are you still Auburn? Still Auburn. Okay. In fact, I I actually practiced law in Tuscaloosa for three years. Okay. And uh, that made me an even stronger <laughs> Auburn fan too, because the first case I tried by myself, I was with a small firm. And we had a plaintiff's case, and they did defense work, so they put me in that plaintiff's case. I go over and try the case, and we start the trial. And during jury voir dire, Judge Charlie Warren was a judge, and he looked over at the jury, and they were all men, by the way, all white men. Looked over at him and said, well, this is Jerry Beasley representing the plaintiff. Said, he's a good young fellow. Said, his only problem is he went to Auburn. That's funny. And, so, <laughs> and, I, and I, I knew then that everybody I was looking at in that courtroom would have been Alabama. Right. <laughs> but you didn't have any voir dire to do. You just said, hey, well, let's I just start the of, case. I sort of figured it time to <laughs> think, think about heading back home. Right. So, so all right, so you, you graduate law school. You, well, how did you like law school? Did, did I, you... I really enjoyed law school. In fact, uh, I, I really worked hard, studied hard, uh, during the time I was there, I had the good fortune to clerk for a very good law firm, Jones, McCann, and Allman. Uh, worked there in the afternoons every day after after getting out. I, I did my schedule where I normally would put in four hours of work every day. And I uh, really enjoyed it and enjoyed law school. And Was it back then, was it kind of the paper chase like? Do you think it, it seems like it was probably back then a little more rigorous? Rigorous it, is probably the wrong word, it, but a it, little more harsh. It, uh, it would have been. And it, it was. It was. Yeah, I'd say probably that the the, the instructors would really uh, work on you to make you a better lawyer. Right. Really, and, and and you would be singled out. For example, uh, you get up and give a case, and they would pretty much cross-examine you really, really right. in, in a harsh, tough way, but a good way. Right. I think that's changed a little bit. It probably has, and the size of the classes have probably changed dramatically. Right. Uh, then I, we started uh, our entry class would have been 65, and only 15 of us graduated. You're kidding. Is it because they were weeded out or just they well, left I, for a some, variety of reasons? Some weeded out. Some just couldn't do it. In fact, right. the thing that amazed me, some of the, a, some of a, the guys that came in with the best grades from undergraduate right. school, one guy flunked out. And I never have right. understood that. Right. Interesting. Well, so so you graduate, and and then what do you decide to do? Well, I, I, I thought that I was going to be able to sort of name where I wanted to go at whatever price I wanted to go at. Uh, found out that that was not the case. Uh, I'd done well in law school. In fact, uh, extremely well academically. Did, in law school, did you put a lot of effort at a lot of time? We, yeah, you said yeah. you were working four hours a day. So. I, I studied hard. And uh, the, the, the one thing I did, I, I never studied the night before a final. I, right. I, I'd been told that you need to be you calm, better be ready. relaxed, and ready. Right. So I took it to the extreme and didn't study. I, I would uh, say and I would go to a movie or read a book or whatever. It had nothing to do with law. You think your classmates were looking at you, man? That guy, that guy's brilliant. <laughs> well, they, did, they didn't know that. Uh, I never told anybody that, but that's really the way it worked. And so when I got out, I had done well academically, thought I was going to be in great demand. Found out that that, I, that, that really nobody in the class was getting any real good job offers. Right. I got one offer in Huntsville, one offer in Tuscaloosa. Do you, do you know who the offer in Huntsville? Was yeah, from? Uh, Nelson Camp who was, had been an insurance claims adjuster and had opened, he'd gone to law school and then opened his office. Okay. He was doing insurance defense. And uh, my mother was a camp, and we tried to figure out how we were kin. Oh, I see. And uh, I think we finally figured out we were distant cousins. Uh, but he, he was really a good guy, and I liked him. Uh, 
he offered me $400 a month, and I got the same offer in Tuscaloosa, $400 a month, from a, a insurance defense firm, a one-man firm. So since by that time uh, I lived there and didn't have a lot of money, so I figured stay there. So I don't have to move. Don't have to move, right. and I did. Uh, stayed stayed there with the lawyer's name was Olin Zena. He had been uh, then you called him prosecutor. He'd be district attorney okay. now, and he'd come out of that as a pretty hot commodity and started doing insurance defense. He was from Holt, Alabama, which. Uh, it's not exactly the blue ribbon uh, area of Tuscaloosa, good folks, but gotcha. working class folks. And he had he had a desire to be socially accepted, so he started doing defense work. Okay. So you start doing that work? I did that and, and never did like it. In fact, uh, I look back and we'd get authority to settle cases, say, just to, for clarity, $100.00. They say don't pay the hundred, settle for less than a hundred. You're and, kidding. And that was our that was our standing orders right. for most of the companies. And I did that, and we worked hard at it. And it, it really just sort of, uh, I just didn't like it. And right. uh, my plan was to go back to Clayton. And so the, he, my boss made it very easy for me because first year made 400, second year 450 a month. Third year, no raise. And so I knew then that. No, right, what, no why no raise? Just, Jerry, money's tight. I, well, he didn't even say that. And uh, I knew that we were doing well. I right. knew the firm was doing extremely well. And I knew that hey, I. Listen, had, I'm settling these cases for $25. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, we had a, a, a good thing going as sure. far as the practice. And I, I really didn't like it. So I was not disappointed sure. because I thought about, I'd already thought about going back to Clayton, my hometown. So, as it turned out, I actually went upstairs in the same building. It was the first out, first Alabama bank building, I think it was called, and we were on fourth floor. Firm ab above us, uh, Jones, McCann, and Allman. I'd clerk for. Her. They were in the same building. I thought about talking to them, but then I got a call from Mr. Albert Dominic with the uh, law firm of Dominic. Uh, I believe it was Dominic. Davidson and Roberts, something in that it might have been Roberts and Davidson. Anyway, they asked me if I'd be wanting to come up and maybe spend some time with them. Found out that Bill Donald, who was in that firm, was actually coming down to go to work with Olin Zena where I'd been, where I was, wow. which uh, apparently that was one reason I didn't get a raise. So I told Mr. Dominic, sure, I'd be able, to, I'd spend a few months with them. Right. So I went up and actually went to Bill Donald's office and took over whatever he was doing. And uh, it, it was really a, a good law firm, and I really liked it better than where I'd been. And I thought about maybe I'm going to stay there. And uh, I, I really had a very good time practicing with him, enjoyed it. And Mr. Dominic called me in one day and he said, Jerry, he said, sit down, let's talk about your future. He said, I know you want to go back to Clayton where you grew up. And I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, we'd like for you to stay. Said we'll make you a very uh, good offer with good security. You already live here. You know everybody now, and they seem to be fairly well liked. Said I'm just going to put it put, you, put it to you fairly straight. Said you can go back to Clayton, and you'll be a big fish in a very small pond. Right. Or you can stay here with me, and you'll be a very little fish in a real big pond. So it's up to you what you want to do. I said, Mr. Arbor, you've explained it to me. I'm going to Clayton. <laughs> so, so that's what you decided to do. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I sort of, that, that had been my plan. And I, I, I would have had to back up on my plan to stay there. And I also had another offer from uh, a firm, uh, Mize, Spiro, and Phelps. Sam Phelps and I were good friends. And Sam wanted me to stay there with them. And that was really a more attractive situation right, because right. I, I really they did a lot of what I wanted to do and that is plaintiff's work so all right so you you moved to Clayton moved back to Clayton we moved uh there and uh I went in with a lawyer named A.B. Robertson did you go in as an employer did you no this... we actually made a he made me a partner in his firm he okay. was a sole practitioner 
But this is now a small firm. I'm One just, man firm, and this I, I was the second person. And uh, he, I knew he was a good lawyer. Are, are you worried at this point? I mean, now you've got a small family and you're... You know, I, I really, I never worried a whole lot about anything, to be honest with you. Uh, I just sort of took it day to day, right. day by day, and, and never did give it a whole lot of concern or worry about what may happen or not. You know, In what you just happen. felt like you could make it work, is that well, a fair statement? Well, I, I just felt like that... that yeah, I, I thought I, I thought I had the ability to make it happen, and I really um, didn't. Uh, at that stage, I really didn't have the relationship with God that I do now. Looking back, uh, I do know that that He led me through a lot of stuff that that where I'd mess up and He'd get me out of it. Um, and, and when did that? And we'll work, we'll work backwards here in a yeah. second. But when did you develop your relationship with God? I mean, when, how uh, did that? You know, I, I thought I already had it. Be honest with you, and growing up, sure, uh, because of my mama primarily. Uh, it, it really was after I got married, and after uh, just realizing there was more life than what I knew about. And uh, it, it's not no earth shaking, uh, earthquake type experience. You just uh, you just know that's the way to go. You know, I like on your, and we'll talk about the Jerry Beasley report yeah. in a minute, but I like how you, you always have a biblical verse and you kind of comment on it. I, I, I like that a lot. I think that, and you do that, if I'm not mistaken, near the end of the, the report. Yeah. It's, and it, it's kind of a nice closing. Yeah, and I, I try to do it in a way that I'm, I'm not trying to push anything on anybody. Right. Yeah, and it doesn't come across like yeah. you're proselytizing or uh, preaching. You uh, just and, and I've got Jewish friends, for example, sure. who... Uh, respond and and, sure. and make comments and ne never derogatory, but uh, you know, and, and I, I just feel like that uh, it's important to, to if you believe something, I think it's important to let other folks know because I, it helps them. Right. Well, so so how do you start your your interest in politics? How does that come about? Well, if anybody's ever lived in Barber County, politics is a way of life there. In fact. Uh, when I went back to Clayton, I knew there was a faction in Clayton in Barber County, uh, the Marshall Williams faction and the George Little faction. Uh, George Little, the probate judge in Eufaula, he had a faction of the Eufaula folks primarily, some in Clow, and then the rest of the county would be the Marshall Williams factor. That would be Clayton, Louisville, Baker Hill area, Texasville area. So when I go back with A.B. Robinson, I never really thought about the fact that I was identified, my family had been identified with the Marshall Williams faction. But you, up to this point, you'd never really been political? No, zero, mean, zero politics okay. in my life. And your family, and, not, not well, really? My granddaddy had run for sheriff one time and got beat and said he'd outlived all his friends. He said he needed to start carrying a pistol. Right. <laughs> uh, but but no, nobody, no, he, okay. he ran because... Only reason he'd run, he he needed a job. Sure, but no, I and so but I go back in with A. B. Robinson, and I find that he is a part of the other faction. So he called me in the second day after I'd moved back to Clayton, and after the first day in the office, called me in, closed the door, said, "Jerry, you're, you're thinking, hey, maybe I'm getting a raise already." <laughs> I, I, I thought, man, I'm getting in really good. I'm in the big <laughs> office. So I go in and he says, uh, we need to have a little understanding on politics. I said, sure, sure. He said, now we don't represent anybody on that Marshall Williams bunch, from that Marshall Williams bunch. So that, that includes the Greens out in B-Day. day said, you know, uh, I know your daddy and granddaddy have had contact and relationships with them and also Marshall. said, but now in our firm, we don't represent any of them. And I said, you talking about them? And I said, your mama was a green, A.B. I said, well, he said, yeah, but that's different. I said, well, now you're telling me that we can't. Are, are you mad at this no, point? No, no, no. You're... I just want to understand right, it. Right, right. Uh, because we never discussed it pre preliminarily. So I just said, uh, let's just have an understanding. You're telling me that we cannot represent any of the Marshall Williams faction, which is a pretty good group of folks. Sure. He said, that's exactly right. He said, that's the way that it has to be. So I get a knock on the door. We didn't have the fancy intercom systems then or any type contacts other than, sure. and then he, the human contacts. So 
His wife was our secretary. She knocked on the door and said, Jerry, you got your first client. I said, that is great. I said, who is it? She said, Floyd Green. I said, good Lord have mercy. <laughs> and I looked over at A.B. and, and I, his face was red as a beet. And I said, well, I got to make a decision. And so I said, uh, Moselle, just tell him to go in the office. I'll be right with him. So I go in and, and sign him up and represent him. And from that day forward, I knew that I wasn't going to make it with A.B. Robinson. Right. So I, I, I knew that it was going to be stare, He must be staring at you when you say, tell him to come to my uh, office. He, he absolutely didn't like it. In <laughs> fact, uh, and, and for the next, uh, I stayed there one year. I knew that. And I, this is like on day two or three. Of this you was this there? was the second day of. Our, our <laughs> Are you like? Why did I change? <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, I, I, well, I did think. I said, am I jinxed or what? Right. I said in Tuscaloosa, I couldn't hold a job, <laughs> and I said, here I come back here, and I found out right off the bat that half the county I can't represent. Right, right, right. So I've just lost half my client base. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, I, I, I actually represent Mr. Green and, and try his case, and we win. Uh, but but then uh, it's our relationship, mine and, and Mr. Robson, A.B. Robson, was really strained from that point forward, and I knew it was just a matter of time. So at the end of the year, I just told him, I said, look, if your interest and my interest, I think it's better for me to, to right. leave. And I said, I respect you and like you, and uh, we're on different political sides, apparently, and uh, so I made my mind up, and I went over and opened an office uh, uh, by myself uh, next to the old banker commerce. So at this point, you're like, I'm going to slow down with any partners. I don't need all this. I, I really thought <laughs> I really thought to myself, uh, maybe I ain't living right or something, because I said, uh, this ain't the way it's supposed to be. But as it turned out, uh, I, I moved over there, and, and business became pretty good. And the only thing I didn't like about it was I wanted to do trial work. And I was having to do a lot of other things like title work, right. deeds, mortgages, wills. You mean to make ends meet. I to mean, make the trial ends work, meet. It's, yeah. it's great yeah. when it hits, but yeah. it's a long time. And, and, and I just knew that in that type of practice, I was not going to be 100% happy. Sure. And But I enjoyed living in Clayton. I mean, Clayton's a great little town. And... Uh, I, you know, if I could, my wife would move back there tomorrow, if I'd let her. And, of course, uh, it's changed a lot, but it was right. just a good little town to grow up in. So so now you're on your own. What happens next? Well, we, uh, we end up, uh, another Robinson comes in who graduated from law school, Bill Robinson. And there was a, a fellow named Horace Williams who'd been an insurance adjuster in Montgomery from Ufala, or moved to Ufala. So we made a, a three-person partnership, uh, Beasley, uh, Williams, and Robertson. We had an office in Clayton and one in Eufaula. And uh, I, I practiced there until 1970 when I got in politics. So, so how do you decide, how do you get into politics? Well, it, it was sort of interesting. In 1966, when Lurleen Wallace ran for governor, uh, Gerald Wallace, who was George Wallace's brother, asked me if I would work in her campaign and help them do some things. And I, and I told him, well, yeah. I'll and up to this point, you've really no political involvement. Had, had, You're just a lawyer who's now kind of getting known just, around town. Just a country lawyer who was doing pretty well and right. happy as a lark. and. So I, I, I get involved there with her, and she really was a good person. She, she was honest. She was sincere. Was she the governor before George Wallace? No, she. Uh, he he ran and was elected. At that time, you could not run for a second term. Okay. Okay. And uh, he had had that succession fight in the legislature and lost. And so, uh, Lurleen ran to replace him, and, and sort of surprised everybody. That, that, that she would be a candidate. Uh, I'm reasonably sure that, that uh, George Wallace and Gerald Wallace and Jack Wallace, the other brother, and a lot of the other people in his uh, political camp uh, talked her into running. I don't think she did it on her own. Gotcha. But once she got into it, she was really a good candidate. And 
would have been a very good governor, in my opinion. But I got involved there and, and, and made speeches for traveled around mostly southeast Alabama. Now, are you thinking back to your speech class? Were you uh, the, the one that got well, you started? <laughs> I, I admit that it, it, it must have had some effect. Right, right. I, a, I a positive effect. A positive right. effect. And, it, and when I, that campaign was over, I still didn't have any, I, I had no thinking, I was not thinking about running myself. Sure. Uh, I did enjoy it. I liked it. Uh, it was different then. You had campaign rallies, and you'd right. go to different towns, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I was doing that, and and never had any idea that I'd ever be a candidate. Then something did happen that uh, probably had more effect was 1968. Uh, I got a call from a friend of mine, Finus Gaston, two friends really, Finus Gaston from Tuscaloosa, and Tom Coker who at that time, he's really from Lowndes County, and I think he probably was, I think he was in Montgomery. They called me and asked me uh, if I would be willing to come into the Jim Allen campaign. He was called then James Allen, by the way. The, he'd been Lieutenant Governor twice, uh, James B. Allen, and he was running for the U.S. Senate. And I was asked if I would come in and, and be involved in the campaign. As it turned out, they made me the campaign manager wow. for his campaign. Very young age, uh, very inexperienced. And how old are you around this then time? Then I would have been 68, 33, 32. Okay. And are you also thinking, well, how, I've got to run this campaign. I've got a full-time law practice. Well, they paid me uh, where I could be away from the office. Okay. And, okay. I, and I was away a great deal. Uh, and the race well, that makes it a little more palatable. Yeah, and we got in the race, and I got into it, and I realized that I thought had Jim Allen having been uh, lieutenant governor twice, right. that he would have been a shoe in right. against the, the congressman that he was running against, Armstead Selden. Saw the first poll, and it showed Selden sixty-eight percent, Jim Allen in the low thirties. Uh, I think it was thirty-one, thirty-two. And I knew then that I'd gotten into something that maybe was not going to be successful. And the first thing we did, and I, and I go back a step further, the, the brains behind the entire Allen campaign at that time, would, the, the brain would have been uh, Jimmy Faulkner from Bay Bonnet, a highly successful uh, businessman who had actually run for governor and lost at one time, but very active politically. And he was really the person who I think got me involved in the campaign through my two friends. Uh, the first thing we did had a poll, the Quail Company, Oliver Quail Group did the poll, showed that very bad result. Also said that you need to change the candidate's name from James to Jim. Okay. And so he became then Jim Allen. And if you check all the records, you'll see part of that time He'd never been referred to as anything James, but James, gotcha. James B. Allen. Right. <clears throat> and one of the smartest men I've ever dealt with, by the way. So I get in the campaign, and it, it turns out to be a, a, just a good experience insofar as politics. And we ended up, uh, he wins. Uh, and George Wallace, by the way, Governor so Wallace. So he won the Senate seat? Yeah, he won the Senate seat. Okay. And he did it, uh, George Wallace, the, who had been governor, and Lurleen was governor at the time, right. uh, supported uh, Armstead Selden against Jim Allen. And that came as a shock, too, because I, th I thought Allen, having been lieutenant governor right. under Wallace, that he would have been sure. far but, but he wins, and you're the campaign chairman. But I, I So admit, you, you've I, got to have some cachet now. Well, but I really had very little to do with it, to be quite honest with you. Uh, the, the the poll folks pretty well gave us the message. Jim Allen ran against, quote, the Washington crowd. Gotcha. Everything was against the Washington gotcha. crowd. And the issue in the campaign then was, who is George Wallace for? So we had to give the impression that Allen was the Wallace candidate. And at that time, George Wallace was very popular. Right. Wallace never came out publicly, uh, even though he told me in no uncertain terms that he very much disliked Jim Allen huh. and they wanted me to get out of the campaign. So that, after that race was over, 
probably I came out of that thinking maybe that I want to run for something. Right. So, so what year is this, and what do you decide? This to would do? have been sixty nine, uh, late sixty eight, early sixty nine. I go back to Clayton. But, but now you you haven't been practicing law for a little while. Mm, I'd been out of the office for a good since probably April, March, maybe of sixty eight through the end of the campaign. I, I didn't do much at all in the fall. The fall right. back then, the Democrat was going to win. So there was no race to run right. really in the fall, even though gotcha. uh, Perry Hooper was the Republican candidate and, and ran a good hard race but had no chance. Right. So then I got the idea maybe I want to think about running. Since Jim Allen had been lieutenant governor, that office sort of appealed to me. Sure. And I'll be quite honest, I had no idea at that time that the lieutenant governor's office had been part-time under both Jim Allen Albert Brewer and everybody prior to that. It had been part time. Part time. Huh. One secretary, and uh, that's it. Wow. So, so you decided to run for? I it? decided to run, and probably didn't do a lot of research. I didn't really know what I was getting into. Uh, I ran against uh, a, a group of candidates who had been sort of the cream of the crop in the legislature at that time. Uh, and you're pretty young at this point. Yeah, still, yeah, fairly young. Get in the race, didn't have any idea that I was going to come close to winning. I was confident, uh, probably for the wrong reasons, but confident. And uh, we got into the race, had an experience in Tuscaloosa that taught me a lot about early politics, not now type. Uh, we I did a, a, a TV show with a guy named Lonnie Falk, who was a UPI uh, reporter, right, and he had a show on the University of Alabama's uh, TV, whatever it is, uh, station. I, I, after it's over, my wife went with me, and, and he came over and was talking to us. And he said, "I'm going to give you all some free advice." I said, "I'm going to take, take all the free I, advice I can, I, as long I, as it's free." Absolutely, I said, "Let me have it." He said, "I'm going to tell you how to get news every day in Alabama in your race." He said, if you'll have your secretary send me a, a short one-paragraph news release early every morning, I'll put it on the UPI wires for you. Wow. He said, I like you. And I said, he said, I think you'd be good for Alabama. And you're running against a bunch of politicians. Right. And he said, I want to help you. So I said, okay. I said, I don't have a secretary, but I said, my wife Slayer can probably send you what you need. Sure. So every morning, Sarah would call Lonnie Falk, and sure enough, the news started coming out, and I would get free radio, right. free newspaper, free television. Now, the other side wondered, why is Jerry Beasley getting all this they, press? They had no idea. <laughs> and as, as I went around the state, I, I'd hear it on the radio. I'd hear it uh, on the 6 o'clock news, right. watch it. Newspapers back then you had the Post Herald and you had the right. Alabama Journal in addition to the other papers. And you'd you'd have a story almost every day that Jerry Beasley was in Bridgeport and says so and so, and that went on the entire campaign. And uh, if I told you what I spent during that entire race, and I had a primary, a runoff in the primary, and had a a fairly substantial candidate, Republican candidate in the fall. I spent a total of sixty-five thousand dollars. Wow, that's crazy compared and to what that would be now. It'd be they'd be sixty-five thousand dollars a day. Day, right? And that would right. be low, probably. Right, right. In fact, it would be low. But but the other candidates, for example, Hugh Mara, probably spent a million and a half. Right. And I wind up winning the Democratic primary, and and then the Republican general election beat the Republican. And so you win that. And so so what year do you start as This would have been governor? 1970. So I would have gone in office in January of 71. Okay. And, you know, and our country is in a lot of turmoil at that time. How are politicians viewed here? So now that you're in uh, office. Back then, it, it was nothing like today. Uh, politicians were, were, were respected more. Right. Uh, don't say they were totally trusted, but respected more. 
and you didn't have all the negative uh, generally uh, that, right. that we have now. I will say that, that the Wallace Brewer race in 1970 for governor was probably the dirtiest, uh, most negative race that I've ever seen in Alabama, ever. And, and so now you're lieutenant governor, George Wallace is governor, Correct. right, starting in 71. Right. So what kind of relationship do you have with him? Well, we, we, I had a bad relationship with him in the Jim Allen campaign right. because he really was upset that I was involved right. for Governor Allen, as he called him. And I found out it was over the succession bill. He blamed Jim Allen for not pushing oh. the succession bill through so he could right. run for governor. So uh, we started off, though, a good relationship, and I tried my best to have a good relationship. Now, now is the job at that point, is it still is it part-time? Still part-time. And you didn't know that till, till I, I found right, it you out. learned as you I, get closer. During the campaign, I began to wonder. And I did find out when I came to get ready to take over that my job was really going to be presiding over the Senate, which I'd never had any experience with. Right, right. And thanks to a gentleman named McDowell Lee, uh, who was Secretary of the Senate then, and I'd known him all my life. He took me sort of under his wing and taught me the rules of the Senate. Spent about two weeks with me with a right. crash course of instruction. Taught me really how to be a presiding officer. And uh, from that point forward, I felt that I had a good feel for it right. and was able to preside with relatively few problems. And now, what year was it that, that Governor Wallace was shot? What 72. And and so how did that, I mean, so you're back in Montgomery when he's traveling. Yeah, that, that really, uh, it changed my life, changed his life, certainly. Sure. Changed the office of lieutenant governor totally. From that point forward, uh, it was full time. In fact, uh, we, we would get called on almost like I was an assistant governor. And I wouldn't have the power to really do many of the things I was asked to help get done. Right. Uh, but it, it made it both good and bad. And uh, I really, but still, I was having problems with a lot of the, the people in the Wallace administration who saw me as sort of a threat in some fashion. This is while you're the, the governor? Yeah. Uh, it, well, really before that time, I... I, I had to take over as acting governor, and I think it lasted for 32 days. And fortunately, I had a good friend, Bill Jackson, who had been Governor Wallace's legal advisor, and he pretty well helped me have a good relationship with the cabinet. And and quite, just to be candid, a, a lot of them thought Governor Wallace was not going to make it, so they were looking for places to go, so they all of a sudden became my very good friend. Oh, I see. Friend. Probably, sure, that makes sense. And... Uh, but I understood that also. Right. And as it turned out, uh, Governor Wallace survived. Sure. And, and um, he fought very hard, had a very difficult time, much more difficult than people realized. Right. And that's what it sounds like in that recovery. Yeah. Sounds like it, was it, it was a very time. long, long, long recovery. Sure. And he had some very close calls early on. But generally, uh, you know, I, it, it just changed everything for, for the office and for me. So, so after that, so, so when Governor Wallace comes back, so, so now you haven't been practicing law for a number not, of years. Not now. really. I still or had, not, the, I still had the office in Clayton, sure, and still was getting paid and, and was doing some work, but sure. not a lot. And uh, when when Governor Wallace came back, he never really came back full time governor. Right. Uh, he was in the mansion a lot and, and having difficulties. And, and, and as I said, he was a fighter, and he really, really uh, had a difficult time. And it's amazing that he was able to function as well as he did. Right. So, so after that, so, so what do you decide to do? I mean, we get to 74. Well, yeah, I, I really uh, I was pretty sure I was going to run for re-election. I had thoughts about it. Well, what does your wife think? Is there any uh, talk? Hey, let's get back to the well, law practice. Say, well, she never did really think it think in terms of the law practice. I don't think Sarah ever liked politics, just to be honest with right. you. Uh, she's better at spoiling, spotting a phony than I was at that time, and so many phonies in politics. And she never really enjoyed politics like some wives maybe would. Right. Uh, when I ran for re-election, I realized all of a sudden that I was going to have problems. Uh, I thought that I had done a good job. 
and, and, and I, I did change things a lot for the for the legislature, without a doubt. Some of it was unpopular. Uh, I, I felt like though I could win, and so I decided to run and did. As it turned out, I almost lost. In fact, I ran in the I believe I was second in the first primary. And this is 1973 yeah. for the 74. Uh, Charles election. Woods had run and uh, Richard Dominic, a state senator. And had Richard Dominic been the person in the runoff with me, I'm convinced he would have beaten me in the runoff. Charles Woods did not. And it was mostly his fault more than my being a good candidate. But I, I'd have to give uh, Paul Hubbard of AEA and some other folks a lot of credit right. for, for pulling what should have been a loss for me to a win. You know, does that affect you at all? When, so when you're running now, you have all this venom versus, hey, this popular small town lawyers doing good stuff. Now you're in politics. There's a lot of venom and anger towards you and, you know, bad talking about you. I would think that would affect someone. Well, it, it, I hate to say that it did a little bit, but it did a little, but not a lot. In fact, uh, I, I, I never let it bother me. I never let it uh, depress me or make right. me overly concerned. Uh, probably the biggest uh, problem I had was having a, a death threat out of the prison system. We were investigating the prisons, found out they had a government set up inside. The prisoners had their own no kidding. group. And so they actually hired a hitman to get rid of me because I was pushing them, finding out a lot of stuff. Right, right. And I was making a speech down in Grove Hill and all of a sudden tro trooper cars fly in and grab me off the stage and take me home. I found out that sure enough, they'd put out a contract. Well, and especially after what happened to Governor Wallace. Sure. It's not like you can just slough that yeah, off. I mean, yeah. you have to take all that it's very yeah. serious. But I never thought about that, but I certainly didn't expect it to come out of the right, prison. Right, right, right. But, but, you know, af after... I did win that race, and uh, that made me probably made me want to be governor. Probably for the first time, really, really strong, uh, strong feeling. And for the next uh, few months, I did the very best I could to uh, do a good job where I was, thinking that I would probably have a chance to be elected sure. in '78. As it turned out, uh, the '78 race was a uh, probably the most interesting race that I can recall because the three people who were considered the front runners, that would have been former Governor Brewer, Bill Baxley, the Attorney General, right. and me. Uh, when, when the early polling started, it was gonna be a Labor Day type election for the first time, which turned out to be not a good time to run. Uh, but when it started, uh, Fob James got in the race. Nobody considered him a serious candidate all the polls showed he had no... And he was a Republican, right? No, Democrat oh, okay. at that time. Okay. So he gets in, and in the beginning, nobody took him seriously. Nobody really thought he was a factor. And the polling that I was seeing, though, showed a very strange phenomenon taking place. The undecided vote in the beginning had been something like 5%, which was unbelievably low. Right. Because Brewer, Baxley, and, and Beasley had high name recognition and a very high percentage. He also had Sid McDonald in the race who, who would have been considered the fourth candidate. So uh, as time goes on during the really summer months, the undecided started getting higher. Right. And I couldn't figure that out. It wasn't going to FOB, but it was getting away from the three of us. And Fob ran against the three of us, called us the three Bs. Right. He had a fly swatter, kind of silly, but it worked. <laughs> he had a fly swatter, and he'd get in a campaign with us, and he'd be swatting us so, like So you knew all these guys on a personal oh, yeah, level. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did, did you like each other or how? You know, the strange thing about it, I, I liked them all. Uh, Bill Baxley and I were seen as political enemies. And, and, and was it, did, did he go to law school around your time? Behind, he was behind me, but yeah, same law school. Did you know him in law school? No, I didn't. Okay. I, I, I knew him after he was district attorney in right. Dothan. And really, uh, people confused us. They'd think I was back, so they'd think he was me for the full right. eight years I was in office. I'd have people who really thought I was the attorney general right. more than the lieutenant governor. So anyway, 
all of a sudden the polling, like I said, the undecided goes up, and then all of a sudden it starts shifting to five. And I knew then that we were in trouble. And I knew that people were gravitating toward Fob, and he was he, he had a brilliant guy running his campaign, Delos Walker, and he did a great job of putting a campaign together that sold against three established politicians. Gotcha, gotcha. As it turned out, Fob almost won it without a runoff, and I ended up running fifth. And uh, was absolutely, I mean, I, I would have never guessed that I would have been fifth. I thought maybe second, maybe third. Right. And I thought at one time first. In fact, the early polls did show me leading. Right. But he took away the Auburn vote from me. Right. And then all of a, and, and George Wallace was working very hard to make sure I didn't get elected on the telephone every day. No, no, why is that? Uh, he, he, he really, I don't know. I never did understand why he really... He, I don't know. I can't understand it. Never. I knew him back when I was a kid. You know what's strange about that? It seems like people that thought that they were friends with him, he wouldn't take their side. At least, I mean, this is now, you're, this is the second time you've said that. Or he didn't act. Well, he, he saw, George Wallace saw everybody as a threat to him. Right. He wanted, nobody else would be center stage. Right. Uh, and he killed off a bunch of politicians. I don't mean literally, but right. politically. And, uh, and and I just happened to be one of them. Right. So, all right. So this is, are, are you, so that that's kind of a reckoning. You've been Lieutenant Governor for eight years now. So do, what do you decide to do then? Well, I decided that, that I was not a very good politician <laughs> and maybe I need to practice law. Right. So, I was having some success about it. I, back but I, I, go, I go right back to 1962 when I graduated from law school. Come out then only get two job offers. Here I've been lieutenant governor, like right. I said, for eight years, and I thought, well, surely to goodness, I'd right. be, I'd, I'd the be biggest honest. firms in the state are going to be knocking they, on my door. Be, yeah, and believe fact, me, right uh, now, I bet you they wish that they had. <laughs> well, I sent resumes out to every firm in Montgomery that was an established firm, a couple in Birmingham, right. and I did not get a single response, not even a rejection. I didn't even get a response. You know what's crazy about that? And I'm sure young lawyers and especially law students that are struggling, looking for work. I mean, the job market doesn't is not any better right now than when you were getting out and looking for work in 62. It's probably, it's probably worse. It's probably worse right so, now. So the people have got to take a lot of heart in what can happen down the road by looking at what you've done. Well, you know, I, I, I really, uh, looking back, I, I knew I was in debt from the campaign. Right. And I knew that I, I didn't want to go back to Clayton. So I thought that I'd be able to get a job very easily. And when I saw that was not going to happen, I get a call one day from Judge, then Judge Truman Hobbs, who's a federal judge. And he said, Jerry said, uh, I know you're disappointed. He said, I'm going to give you some, some advice. He said, there's only one lawyer that I would call and see if he maybe you could work out something with him. And if that doesn't work, just open up your office. Right. He said, you've got ability, and you've been around, and you've got name recognition. Right. And he said, you're going to attract some clients. And, and what does Sarah think at this point? What are, what are she her She is thoughts? not a bit concerned at all. She has no concern. Isn't totally that the supportive. way with wives? They, they usually have more faith than, uh, she, <laughs> than she, the principal. She, right? she was absolutely unbelievable. In fact, uh, she was really a pillar of strength. Uh, she, when she found out how much we owed from the campaign, right. I was getting bills from folks that, Right. Whether I owed it or not, uh, I felt like I did have sure. to pay it. So anyway, uh, you think I, you think uh, people were saying, "Hey, just send Jerry a bill; he'll pay it, yeah, well, <laughs> whether, true, he, yeah. whether he owes it or not." I mean, I, I was getting bills for barbecues in Decatur, right. and Gibson's barbecue. Right. I think they right. sent me a bill. And anyway, I, I so I just said, "Well, I've got a law degree. I know a little bit about practicing law." So I found me a place over on Hull Street. Opened the office, and like I could say, I was the only lawyer. And, had and you decided to stay in employees. Montgomery. Definitely wanted to stay here. I mean, it's a pretty big metropolis. So, and it's just you. And that, at that time, just me and two female employees. So you start that, and and does business start coming in pretty good? Uh, surprisingly, it, it came in better than I expected. Uh, first day, I got a very good plaintiff's case. Uh, and from that point forward, things seemed to 
I mean, it just was, it was good. And do you decide just to do plaintiff's work at that point? That's what I wanted to do, and uh, as it turned out, I didn't have much choice either because I was not getting any offers to do anything else. Uh, all the all the things that would come to us would have been plaintiff type cases at that time, and that's really what I wanted to do. I can't say that I had any uh, just design plan where that was going to be. You know, I was going to be a plaintiff's lawyer and nothing else. It probably happened just because that was what was coming in. But that's what I wanted to do, though. Well, you know, when you're doing that, so our law firm, we do a lot of the, the plaintiff's work we do is generally consumer-related uh, stuff. But, you know, we, we do other stuff. We do yep. bankruptcy and that. So, But in the pure plaintiff's work you do, it's kind of feast or famine. Is that a fair statement? That Well, yeah. Uh, in, in fact, when, I, when it was just a small firm over on Hull Street, uh, it grew there. Uh, it probably got to be maybe seven or eight lawyers before we moved to the Bell Building, and it, it's evolved. Uh, we've added on, added on. Then we moved here on 218 Commerce, first building here. I really thought that was going to be it. I thought that was going. And be that's it. the building we're in right now. Yeah, this the is the 218 Commerce. Because you were telling me right when I got here. I mean, it's kind of a, a metropolis here. I mean, we've got there's four buildings here. Yeah. We have four buildings, and uh, and these are all historic buildings. Yeah, they're all historic like, buildings. And this area restored. is a beautiful area of Montgomery, and since then, uh, the downtown area has just grown by leaps right. and bounds in a positive way. And so, uh, the, the thing, the, the the smartest thing we've done as a law firm, and I, I can take no credit for it. It was not my idea. In fact, I was sort of halfway against it. We decided to divide into sections. We have lawyers and sports staff in a section that's all they do for example the product the personal injury and products liability right. section headed up by Cole Porters where Greg Allen is a senior guy right we have uh, lawyers who have developed expertise in their product liability and also personal injury and all the support staff same way we and have, you have you do cases nationwide. Nationwide, in fact, uh, all over the country. As a matter of fact. Um, so, so how does that work? Are those lawyers gone? Like I know you you were involved in the in the talcum powder we, the, case. I tried the first talcum case in St. Louis. Lasted about five six weeks, and uh, and that was in St. Louis. So everyone, you must have had half the office or a well, good we chunk had, of the office. We there. had uh, a lawyer from Mississippi that had gotten us in those cases, Alan Smith. And we probably had four or five lawyers from here and about five support staff that gotcha. stayed there the entire time. We also have the toxic tort section. We right. have the consumer fraud and commercial right. litigation. And the one that's been probably as, as active as any other is the mass tort section. And that's primarily uh, litigation involving the pharmaceutical industry. Right. And uh, Andy Birchfield heads up that section. But when we did that, D division approach it's given us the ability to handle cases in that particular field develop an expertise that it would be difficult to do if we were trying to do it all do it all right and right. Uh, it's worked and well you know the thing about your firm and it's just talking to you today i i, I kind of see this evolution to a person, everyone we deal with, so we do cases with sure. your firm, and we, we sure try to, and uh, we can identify the cases, but uh, everyone here is just very, I mean, they're they're kind, they're nice, they're responsive, and uh, and it's not kind of like you said before, they don't talk above you, I mean, they know, they have, you know, we may have some expertise in some of the areas we do, Sure, your folks have expertise in a lot of areas we know nothing about, but the, but they never talk down to you. I mean, they yeah. kind of explain it, and they're they're kind about it. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's impressive. It's, it's, it's a credit to you. It, it's been a good relationship, and, and we decided early on that we were going to work with lawyers in, in communities, sure. in, like say Huntsville, or Birmingham, or Florence, or Mobile. We weren't going to try to go in and open an office, and we would want to work with local people there. Uh, and it's worked for us. Is that why you, I was thinking with, with the kind of reach you have, I was thinking, because I know you just opened the Atlanta office, yeah. you, you, did, you said early, or earlier on today, but I was like, well, why, I wonder why Mr. Beasley didn't open offices in other locations. 
we just we just decided it's best to work with other people who are already there. Sure, that makes a ton and, of sense. And, and uh, we've established good relationships. Sure. And uh, like you said, we really try to treat folks like we would expect to be treated. Right. And well, I will say mission accomplished. Yeah, and it and, you know it's just the way it ought to be, and uh, that way you don't have any problems, you don't have any misunderstandings. You have a good understanding going in and a good one going out. And it's been a continuing relationship, and we really, I mean, it's, it's been good for everybody. Well, I, I want to, and I'm going to jump around a couple of things. I'm, I'm keeping you late on a Friday. I hope you don't mind. No. I, I've just got some other things I do want to ask you. And to that point, so um, you're very successful. That's very evident. And it, we're Friday. It's around 345. Uh, you're in a suit and tie, or at least a shirt and a tie like I am. It's yeah. a little warm outside. Um Retirement? Do you slow down at all? Do you take any time off? Do you travel? Uh, you know, my wife reminded me uh, a few days ago that we did not take a vacation last year. And I got to thinking, I really didn't. Uh, I enjoy working. Uh, don't have any hobbies. Do you work? So tell me that. Do you work five days a week? Uh, five and some on Saturdays usually. Uh, I, I, I have no plans to retire. Uh, I've, I've made the same You're making my wife very happy when you say this. She's got <laughs> well, to say the same thing to me. I, 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 you know, my wife doesn't want me to retire. And uh, I really think working for her would be a lot harder than working here. <laughs> right, right. So <laughs> You're coming here to get a break. Right? Yeah. and uh, But I have, I have told the senior people here, I said, look, sure. if, if I start slipping physically, I can figure it out. But I said, when I start slipping mentally, I want you to tell me. Right. And I think they will. Well, what time do you come in? Like a I get up about day? five o'clock every morning. I, uh, I really go by the antique store that my wife owns, Pickwick. I go by there and just go through and look at it. Right. And 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 when it's closed, it's closed. Nobody right. there but me. Right. And I go in and just look around, and, uh, and then I come to the office. Usually, we get here pretty early, and uh, work generally to normal hours in the afternoon, and. Uh, don't work quite as much at night as I used to. Right. Uh, I still try cases. I tried one recently, the cab guard case that we tried and got a very good verdict and ended up settling it without having to go on an appeal. Uh, lasted about two weeks. Well, when you're trying these cases, I mean, that's a day and night operation, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're working, you've, you've finished a trial day at five, say, you're probably a little panicky, you gotta get things righted for the next day, so you're probably working until 10. Yeah. Trial starts again nine, and and really, uh, it, it you know, I'm a pretty laid back guy. I don't get too nervous. Don't get too right. excited. Everybody gets a little nervous if they if, if they say they don't. They, right. They're really not telling the truth. I've never started the case that I wasn't a little bit nervous about it. More concerned for the client to make sure we get a good result for him because we'll have other cases. Sure, and, uh, and that's one thing every lawyer needs to know that. That client doesn't have another case, and you've got to make sure right. you do the best right. you can for them. So anyway, I, I enjoy trying the cases, and uh, don't try quite as many as I used to, maybe. Uh, but we, we got one coming up. We got two, in fact, coming up fairly soon. One a case involving a death case, a child school bus, and another one where in Chilton County where. Lady riding down the road, school teacher going to work, other side of the interstate, a, a big tandem wheel comes rolling down the interstate and hits her car, bouncing across the median into right. her lane. And fortunately, she's disabled but didn't was not killed. Right. If that if that wheel had hit, say a school bus or sure. a van full of folks head on, it'd been a disaster. And uh, we, 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 I'm helping Greg Allen on that case and my daughter, Julie. Uh, I'll be the third lawyer in that case. It's, so you're, you, you have how many children? I have three children and six grandchildren. And, and Julie practices? Julie's a lawyer with us, has been, gosh, a long time now. She's in the cutting horse business, so she tells me she's not going to work nearly as long as I do. <laughs> Uh, is, is she the only one of your children that has followed you? Yeah, uh, no, nobody else. Uh, my daughter, B is married to a lawyer in, who practices in Auburn. Right. And uh, Jerry is not a lawyer, so 
I, I, I'm not convinced. In fact, I, I don't think they ever had any inclination to right. be lawyers. You know, the one thing you've said about not retiring and not having I mean, I don't have any hobbies. I like to read, and my wife is like, that would be very boring for her. So, and I, you know, I get enough reading, and so I kind of plan on doing this till it's over. I mean, it's kind of my hobby. Yeah, you know, if, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're in the wrong business. Has been my philosophy, and I like it, enjoy it. Well, that makes me feel so much better. If this is good enough for you, it's good enough for me. <laughs> well, what's um? So tell me, the Jerry Beasley report. So I started getting that years well, ago. I, I started doing it uh, a letter type report that was basically sent out in, internally in the firm, and. Uh, I've forgotten who mentioned it, but somebody said, well, why don't you send it out to the folks that refer cases to us? So we started doing some of that. And I'll be honest with you, I don't have any idea who all gets it. I know that at one time we were mailing out 63000 a month. Right. And you can also get it on the Internet. Well, you know, I've got to, I've got to talk to Kathy. Uh, I've been trying to set it up so I get it on the Internet, and I haven't gotten it that way yet. You, you can do it, but I'm... Yeah, maybe, not, I, maybe I, I've done something wrong. I, I, so. Well, I'm not the one to ask, I'll tell you that. But Kathy will know what to tell you. No, can friend or foe get it? So yeah, your, anybody can. Your, your, your opponents can get it yeah. as well. In fact, uh, one funny thing happened. We were, it was, we were trying the Vox litigation down in uh, federal court in New Orleans. The judge called a status conference, and uh, we all come into his out of, out of, not in the chamber, but out of office, and a reception area, and on the desk, on, on the table rather, where everybody was sitting, was a Jerry Beasley report. And uh, I, I thought to myself, uh, surely to goodness, I'm not going to ask for a continuous or something. <laughs> but uh, the judge didn't have it in his office, but it was there in his office. That's funny. Well, it's good and, to know the judge has probably read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I enjoy doing it. I, I have people help uh, on some of the articles, and we try to put things in there that will help people, not just lawyers, sort of what's going on in, in the legal world. Well, I kind of think my podcast is a poor man's version of the Jerry Beasley Report. <laughs> well, it's more, it's more modern. Uh, and, and really, uh, you know, putting a message out is important because people, the average person doesn't really get right. uh, the real message on litigation, for example, or no, your, your report's stuff. phenomenal. Yeah, our, our, we have our entire staff read it. I yeah. mean, it just, it gives you cutting edge stuff yeah. on what's happening. No, I, that's very much appreciated. In fact, I'm doing the final draft this afternoon, and it should go to the printer today, I hope. So that's funny. Um, uh, you know, what do you think of the future of law? What do, where do you see it going as far as, uh, I wanted to ask you this, just from your vantage point, where do you see it going with artificial intelligence? I mean, do you think lawyers become, there's part of me that says no, but but then I, you know, I'm certainly not a seer. I mean, are lawyers replaceable? I mean, did, does, the, does the profession diminish or contract? I think it becomes more important, quite frankly, because... There's so much uh, going on in the world today that, for example, who would have thought we'd have driverless cars? Right. I see that as a potential real problem for folks because I, I can't see the technology being advanced enough for right. that to work for a long period of time. Uh, you're going to have some problems there. But you've got all sorts of cutting-edge stuff out there right now that require lawyers that... Uh, you know, we've got a president right now who's trying his best to unregulate every right. conceivable business. We already do a poor job of regulation because they're not funded properly, the regulatory agencies. And so now we're going in the opposite direction. Well, let's go back to politics and that. I, and I think our politics are aligned. Why do you think this state, again, I'm not from here, it just, it's just, it's very strange to me that almost by your election, that, that election, things switched from the Democrat, it became Republican here. It, it's hard to explain. In fact, uh, I think the same people who elected George Wallace elected Trump, basically. In fact, I could close my eyes and hear Trump, and I could hear the George Wallace message. Right. Uh, a populist message, an anti-government message. But you know of, what I don't get? A lot get. of if it's, hate if it, involved. If it's a populist message, what's wrong with 
us taking care of our citizenry. I mean, that drives me wild. We all do better. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt you. If, if Jerry Beasley does great and I do pretty well, that doesn't hurt you. We don't need you to do really great and me to do really poorly. I know. I mean, that's what I don't it's get. It's such a division right now, and, and, and I regret to have to say it, but so much is based on hating something or somebody. Right. And we've let hate get involved in our political dialogue. And uh, Trump was a master at, at dealing yeah. with the hate issues. And uh, he had he had some people advising him, but he's a showman, entertainer. And uh, truth doesn't really matter a whole lot to him. Uh, positions don't matter. Uh, you, nothing's based on real principle or ideology. Well, and the one thing, you know, at the core, right, politics is is home cooking, right? What matters to you? So, you know, my wife has had a bout of cancer, so that's pre-existing. And it's what drives me wild personally. I mean, having, we need universal health care for our citizens. Why, again, if I have to pay a little more in taxes, and maybe you pay a lot more in taxes, but so what? So yeah, if everyone's uh, taken care of, so... You, I don't have quite as nice a car, so what? I'm happy that the person down the street is covered. Well, we owe that to people. In fact, uh, I'm convinced that if we would do it right, uh, you'd reduce the cost of medicine, you'd reduce sure. the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, there's no way to, for example, there's no way to justify a drug company advertising on television to tell you or me, what type of prescription drug we're supposed to be getting. Right. Uh, I think we're the only country in the world that allows it. I'm reasonably sure I'm right on that. Uh, you, you take the cost of, of, of a drug here, compare it to Canada, compare it to most every other country in, in the universe, uh, it, it's no comparison. I mean, right. Yeah, it's... Um... <clears throat> You know, I don't know. I guess we'll see how things go from here. But uh, um, last thing, law students that are listening to this, let's say law students and, and very young lawyers maybe looking to can't find a job. I mean, uh, uh, maybe they're a young Jerry Beasley in 62, 61 looking for work. Tips or thoughts for them? Well, I, I'd say first, uh, I think they ought to do a little more more searching out and researching before they get into law school. Don't do like I did. Just, just, just all of a sudden decide you want to go. Don't think you can do that now. I think you've got to really have a desire to be a lawyer right. and uh, realize that uh, the legal profession is changing. Uh, you can go to a law office now. You'll see law books, which are never used anymore. Right, Everything's right. digital. The decoration, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, it's just all changing. But we, we need lawyers, we need good lawyers, we need diversity in the profession. Uh, I would encourage anybody who really wants to help people, it gives you an opportunity that's unparalleled. In fact, right. uh, I, I hope that I can say with sincerity that one of the things at least that keeps me going is that I really enjoy helping folks that need to be helped. And I see how the average person really doesn't have a chance in our society right now in dealing with the large, huge, powerful corporations that have political muscle right. and spend political bucks in, in the millions. And uh, when we get to the point where a court can say that a corporation is a citizen and right. has constitutional rights, right. uh, we need some lawyers right. to make, Somebody's got to step in to on correct the, that. Uh, isn't it true? Everyone hates lawyers till you need one. Exactly. When you need one, believe me, maybe we, we become best friends. Well, Ron, I'll say the hardest clients we have to satisfy are the business clients that come in and hire us to sue another business. There's never enough money for them. Do you do, you do that a lot? Do we, you, do a, we do a fair amount of it. Um, Arbitration uh, is involved in so much of that type right. of litigation, but we still do. Do, do y'all have an, a separate? So I we deal with arbitration all the time, yeah. and it drives me wild. And so sometimes I'll go right into the lion's den and take them right into arbitration. They have specific consumer statutes that that force yeah. these companies to pay. They don't want to even pay the arbitration fee, so we can kind of backdoor them back into court. But but do y'all have a separate arbitration section, or do you? We, we handle the arbitration cases in D miles section which gotcha. is consumer fraud and right. commercial litigation section right. 
and uh, they're the only ones that do. Yeah, it's um, well, it's just another way that people's rights, without them knowing, without them knowing, gets stripped away. Right? Exactly. I'm going to do something for you. I'm probably going to rip you off. You agree? You can't sue me. Oh, sounds yeah. great. Where do I sign? Well, everybody that's listening to us today, that is looking in their pocket and pull out a credit card, they're going to have an arbitration agreement. Oh. Right. And, and the way they try to enforce, here's their, their enforcement of the arbitration is those privacy notices that us sure. as lawyers don't even read. And it, the fine print, the next time you use this credit card, that is your tacit agreement to the arbitration. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, well, listen, Mr. Bees, I've taken enough time. I hope you'll go home somewhat early on a Friday. And I really enjoyed talking to you. And I really well, enjoyed I've enjoyed it. You made me reflect on stuff that I hadn't thought about in years. So, well, you're a big get, so I really appreciate you sitting down with me. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So that was our podcast with uh, Jerry Beasley. And uh, what a what an impressive man. And, uh, just, you know, t- I take a lot of heart in the fact that he's still practicing. Uh, after all these years so that's what I intend on doing so very impressive and just you know what a what a story he's had and and uh, and the work he's done if you just look up look at his bio look at his firm and uh, like I said at the beginning there's there's not a lawyer in this state who doesn't know who he is and who doesn't respect what he does uh, and his his firm is the same way so they're they're known uh, and believe me, respected like nobody's business. So, uh, and in fact, I was telling uh, my partner Brad Botus, uh, I mentioned to Brad that, and I knew I would feel like this, and I still kind of do. And the uh, if you ever watch Saturday Night Live, so I'm a fan, uh, and I, I never really thought of it as Saturday Night dead during some of those years so i'm a fan during all the seasons and uh the chris farley show if you remember that uh specifically when chris farley's talking to paul mccartney and say uh do you remember the time that you and john lennon saying hey jude do you remember that and he would hit himself in the head that's what i felt like <laughs> but uh really impressive and i really enjoyed talking to him and uh just the nicest guy in the world so um you know, it's no wonder he's built. Uh, hey, everybody. The Next Lawyer Up podcast is sponsored by Bond and Botus. You can find us at bondandbotus.com. That's B-O-N-D-A-N-D-B-O-T-E-S.com. We practice in the areas of consumer bankruptcy, consumer law, including collection and telephone harassment, credit report issues, tax issues, security clearance issues, social security disability, and VA disability. So with that, let's start the show. So let's go ahead and talk about today's episode. Uh, Today I'm going to be speaking with attorney Jerry Beasley. Uh, Mr. Beasley is the founder of the Beasley Allen Law Firm, which is located in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, even though that's the, the base of the firm or the, the home, the headquarters, if you will, they practice all over the country. Um, it is not an overstatement to say that there's not a lawyer in the state of Alabama, and, and frankly, probably most of the country, that doesn't know the name of Jerry Beasley or Beasley Allen. Um, Mr. Beasley's success, his accomplishments, his legal skills, I mean, it, it's absolutely, or, or they are all absolutely legendary. Um, Mr. Beasley.